Hi, I'm Bjorn Stillian Southard, and I'm an associate professor of communication studies at the University of Georgia. Well, thank you for joining us. We are uh, speaking about your book, uh, Peculiar Rhetoric, uh, Slavery, Freedom, and the African Colonialization Movement. Um, and maybe you could kind of give us an overview of what the book uh, is and what it hopes to uh, achieve. Well, thanks for having me, John. Uh, the book takes up this organization from the 19th century called the American Colonization Society. And it was a group that said, we're, that foresaw the tensions between the enslavement regime in the South uh, and freedom fighters in the North and beyond, and said, well, maybe we can find some kind of moderate solution. Um, spoiler alert, there is no moderate solution when it comes to enslavement. It's a terrible idea. But I mean, these are oftentimes political acts actors and um and so kind of getting into this in-between space between i think an issue that is oftentimes thought of as very binary when really when you get down to it there were people that were looking for kind of gradations for how they could um, keep the nation together not to overturn the entire infrastructure of the South. Uh, and people had a lot of different ideas. So the book really just kind of takes up this as a communication problem um, or a communication issue. That is, how do how did people communicate about this uh, in trying to sort through this, this supposedly middle ground as you know abolitionists were raging in the North and overseas and as um, you know, enslavers in the South were just getting more and more powerful and kind of entrenched. And so it kind of is, it looks to say like, not that there was a middle ground, but that at that moment, there were people that were occupying a middle ground, uh, people that were black and people that were white. And so what did that look like? And how, how did those middle, those folks in the middle that were advocating for colonization, uh, what were their arguments? How did they operate? Um, and what are those stories? Yeah, and I, I think that middle ground uh, is uh, really fascinating. It was, uh, I think, it was well located in your book in each chapter. And the, I think the you divide the book into these kind of different rhetoric styles, I suppose. So maybe you could um, walk us through just kind of a basic how you divided the book, and then we'll get into some of the details. Sure. So the the concept, I, I kind of take the fact that. Uh, slavery was kind of used as that uh, was called this uh, peculiar institution which was a nice uh, way of trying to limit how awful it really was uh, and so but this notion of peculiarity being something that kind of um is was it was more than just a part of, of that particular phrasing but is also a part of the the language that is used or the rhetoric of these different groups and so i i kind of go through some case studies and then use particularly either texts or individuals as these as these t tipping points or these moments where we can explore something much broader so i look at the uh, the, the book is divided into first talking about the, the the main discourse of the colonization society, which had a lot of really well-to-do people backing it. Um, the you know major players were included people like Henry Clay, um, Bushrod Washington, who was a Supreme Court justice and the nephew of George Washington. Um, you had a lot of people behind it later on, like Andrew Jackson, uh, James Monroe was involved. I mean, so there's just a lot of people with some with some uh, political clout who were were backing this organization and also a lot of religious leaders from the Northeast oddly were involved as well. And so the first chapter kind of says, okay, as, as a social movement, as a, as a deliberative project, as a political project that is saying, let's get the federal government to fund a colony in Liberia and what would become Liberia in which we would take uh, free people of color, free black people, because they, at this point they were saying we weren't going to free them. Um, and we can move them there. So that's chapter one is just to kind of look through what were their arguments for for this process. Um, you know, in some ways, the least compelling chapter. I, it's chapter one because it sets up the rest of them, but everybody else is kind of working against how poorly argued that case was. Uh, and then after that, it really kind of sets into a, a series of, I would say, a kind of black dominated discourse. So first of all, there's this really small pamphlet or the small editorial you would have called it uh, from the 1817 national intelligencer which was the main uh, newspaper in washington dc and that is this is really kind of doing this satirical take on colonization and it's clear that the the newspaper editors are just they're, they're, they're a little freaked out because they put this little notice at the bottom of the things like don't take this seriously but we have to publish it and uh which i think kind of shows how how bad the arguments were. So I use that to kind of show the different 
approaches to arguing against colonization, but also arguing for abolition. A different, like, a different way, other than just arguing straight down the line, slavery is bad. This kind of use, use of satire and iron and imitation. So it's a, a very much almost like a literary studies take on a really deep read of something that's very short and very small. Um, the chapter after that takes up this guy, Lewis Sheridan, who was a black man who self-emancipated. Uh, he bought his own freedom in North Carolina. And then once he found that he was not being treated the same way as everybody else in North Carolina, he said, well, if you're not going to treat me the same way, then I'm going to uh, seek power passage to this colony in Liberia and his whole process of negotiating with the organization for the best terms possible. He's an interesting character because he's a black person who gets buys his freedom, who then buys slaves, who he then either frees or takes with him when he finally goes to Liberia. Um, and just quite the negotiator, quite quite an interesting character that really I think very few people have ever heard of or know about, but shows how just how even a black person could try to seek some degree of liberty or or their own rights in this process. Uh, chapter after that is um, Hillary Teague is the is the probably the I, I see he's an example of basically a, a George Washington, James Madison, Benjamin Franklin, all wrapped into one in Liberia. So he's somebody that ends up uh, moving with his family to Liberia from Virginia and just becomes just this person that's connected in all sorts of ways and how he's building a culture there that's similar to the United States. But again, how peculiar it is that here is this black man that's trying to reproduce white culture, this white American culture, and how that looks there um, in, in Liberia when there are native people there that end up being enslaved the same way that white people enslaved black people in America. So it's very, again, very complicated. That middle ground is very, is very odd. And then the last uh, main chapter takes up kind of as like using kind of some white folks as the bookends is, is Abraham Lincoln. And his last the last thing he did before issuing the Emancipation Proclamation was in his annual message, he tried to lay out this very rational to him process of how they could pay pay all the enslavers in the South for their slaves, uh, for their enslaved people. Uh, they could colonize people to different colonies, whether it be in Liberia, or, or he'd also paid for the surveyor to go to um like to to Latin America and find a place. Um, and, and Lincoln was, I mean, Lincoln loved Henry Clay. Uh, he called him his beau ide ideal. He thought Henry Clay was just the bee's knees. And so it's not surprising that Lincoln really liked colonization because so did uh, so did Clay. Uh, and so that last chapter is looks at Lincoln and says, here's this last ditch effort for colonization before it's completely off the table because the Emancipation Proclamation is issued. But, well, thank you for that. And I think that um, let's go back to the first uh, chapter and kind of the over uh, view of these, this poorly argued um, idea of colonization. And when I first encountered it, I was kind of shocked by the whole idea. And maybe if you could kind of give us an idea of uh, what they were trying to do and what they thought they were hoping to achieve by creating this middle ground. Yeah, and so the middle ground was, I think it was about fear reduction, right? For and, it, and so it really ends up appealing more, it appeals to neither side. It, so, but their hope was there to kind of stem the rising tide of the anxiety from the South. I mean, I, so in some ways it kind of emerges out of the fear of, uh, of rebellions in the South. And so their argument is, it comes from a, a basic foundational argument that is that is erroneous, which is the the races cannot mix, right? So like you just can't have you can't have free um, and specifically you can't have free black people among white people. Um, and for some people in the South who you know own plantations and were using enslaved labor, for them it was. Uh, free black people were showed too much freedom to those who were enslaved, and so there was the concern that it would uh, give it would give people ideas. Um, and then there was even people in the north who, you know, were ostensibly anti-slavery, but then when it came to bringing people to the north, they were like, mm, I, "We don't, we don't, we don't like that look. They can be free, just not here." So it's like kind of some of like nimbyism, right? Not in my backyard, um, somewhere else, but not here. Um, um, and so there was a lot of there. They were in some in some way they were trying to address 
they could not find an argument that was going to address these two irreconcilable sides, but uh, because it was operating from a position that um, the black people could not be free in that country. Um, and so, and the arguments I think were just very middling. And this is, what, this is where kind of my argumentation and rhetoric training comes in, which is the way that just kind of, they just kind of, kind of ping pong or vacillate back and forth between you know, um, appealing to both sides, but those arguments were mutually exclusive and that they really couldn't be reconciled. And so, at the same time, when you're appealing to one to the you know to people that held slaves or that that were enslaving people in the South, uh, you're appealing to them, but then you're going to say something that's going to antagonize them when you're appealing to the folks in the North. And so it was never going to be satisfying to either side, even though that was the whole point. Um, so it was just it was it was misbegotten as a again as a rhetorical or argumentation project. Like they couldn't find a unifying way to bring these sides together. Um, but they they were trying something that was really based on kind of a, a certain kind of American Whiggishness. And somebody like, you know, the great compromiser that was Henry Clay just thought that everything you could bring people together, um, you could find compromise between uh, these political parties or different positions. Yeah, and the interesting thing that uh, you you kind of kind of really drive home is that it was an argument for and by white people, and only kind of included African Americans and the freed slaves, and really didn't address their um, didn't really address them, I guess. Yeah, absolutely, and 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 the folks later on, like people like Sheridan and Teague, and then I mean, like John Brown Rustworm, who was the editor of Freedom Journal, the first uh, black newspaper in the United States, he ended up immigrating to to Liberia just because he just saw that was the best option for him. He saw a little chance of his uh, of freedom and and full and fully attaining rights and equality in the United States. And so there were people that even though they weren't part of those deliberations and part of that meeting, were just like, well, it's the best option amongst a whole bunch of terrible options. But then there was others like Frederick Douglass, who was just like, this is absolutely, this is garbage. <laughs> and who was really, really good about using colonizationists and Henry Clay in particular as, uh, as punching bags in his speeches. Well, and yeah, let's kind of move into that counter memorial uh, pamphlet you were talking about. And what I found interesting was the way you kind of try to locate whether it was a white author or a free black author and what those two authorships might mean for the uh, argument, but the satirical argument before it. Yeah, and so it's so there's this it, this counter memorial again. It, it basically just uh, it's is pr uh, ostensibly by by free black people from the District of Columbia, um, and it makes all these kind of claims that are done with uh, with a straight face, but that depending on one's position, you either see as hilarious or just absolutely fear producing. So saying like it's no problem like. Um, to intermix the races, you know, will kindly take up with, you know, the with the white women of the area, and so one could imagine that a lot of the, the hysteria in the South about, um, you know, inter the interracial mixing, which, by the way, they only had that concern when it was black men and white women had no problem when it was, you know, the plantation owner uh, and and enslaved women. Um, but so it's like it's saying all this stuff, and you don't know is it is it a white person that's trying to destabilize this to keep you know, to keep the slave system, the slave labor system intact by making people like forget this argument and not and not abide by it. Or is it a black author who is actually kind of, um, you know, Henry Louis Gates has this concept that he develops and a lot of other scholars, um, Geneva Smitherman, talk about signifying, which is like this this kind of this this way of kind of speaking truth to power in a way that also maintains some like veneer of, of that you uh, that you won't get caught. And especially when you're a black person and you're kind of being satirical and kind of have, but it, it could be taken seriously. Um, so that's that black voice is like, are they are they mocking it and trying to reclaim some agency or some power by putting this in a newspaper and, and showing how just ridiculous these arguments are and also how ridiculous the the power dynamic is between blacks and whites with regards to things like you know um interracial marriage and whether or not they can even be in the same uh spaces together and i found it um at least the way it was pre presented a very modern kind of uh rhetorical uh, take i guess and then like it almost sounds like trolling on the internet where you're presenting a fake argument just to like kind of either trigger somebody or to get them to see the ridiculousness. 
Absolutely. And so I, what I find interesting about it is, I mean, this, and this is where, I, you know, I kind of probably stray from the historical field where they would probably be much more concerned with, you know, who was the author as a rhetorician, I'm interested in the viability of the interpretation in that moment. So kind of the subfield that I'm in is in public address. And it's, we talk about reading texts in context. And so it's the fact that one could reasonably read this this counter memorial in these different ways based on how people were talking about this issue at the moment. Um, and yeah, it absolutely was a, a form of kind of trolling. It was, you know, people loved using pseudonyms because again, this was just, this didn't have any names attached. And, you know, there's, a, I mean, I think we know a lot of examples in American history, particularly early on where pseudonyms are used and people are just you know, I mean, if folks have seen like the the musical Hamilton, I mean, like just it captures pretty well how nasty and how sharp the wit could be. And I think even if, you know, because I could, you know, I did, of course, try to find out who wrote this thing. But uh, but that wasn't the point. The point was it could be interpreted viably based on the interpretive norms at the time as of these things, which just showed how both how uh, complex the issue of race and enslavement was at that time, and also just how fragile colonization was as a, as a policy option from the jump. Well, and then, uh, yeah, so let's move into uh, Sheridan's um, and kind of experience with negotiating and uh, kind of this process of moving to Liberia. Because it seemed like the colonialization projects, um, you know, was very good at kind of organizing their arguments, but how good it, were they at actually getting people over to Africa? So. Yeah, the, the, the answer is they weren't very good at that. I think in their first 10 years, they got something like just over 150 people. So from 1820 to 1830, something like 154, 157, 154 people, um, had they had successfully uh, emigrated, you know, whether you call that forced emigration. Um, and so, or, or, or if it was voluntary, but they... That was not very successful. And then in the end, I think over from 1817 up until 1899, when they formally disbanded the organization and just sent all the papers to the Library of Congress, which is how we have such a great record of this, there was something like, you know, Almost 16,000 people were sent through this particular organization. There's a couple of other state-run organizations. This is the only national colonization society. Um, and they had raised like $2.7 million to do this over that long period of time. It just, it was, you know, it was a failure in numbers, which I think is in some ways how people view this. But then you get somebody like Sheridan who, I mean, he, he the, the big national arguments, he doesn't care. He's like, how much stuff can I take? How much of my furniture can I take? How much board feet of lumber should I be taking? Will that be available to me? I mean, this 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 guy's like a general contractor. He's like, what can I, I mean, and you see in these letters, um, and just a quick aside, like the reason that Sheridan even caught my eye is he had the most beautiful handwriting, the most beautiful signature. Uh, when you're looking at old letters on microfilm, something like that catches your eye. And I was actually well past the beginning of his correspondence with the organization before I finally was like, this guy is always writing. And it is amazing. So I jumped way back. I doubled back in my microfilm looking and just see that he's got this long history of correspondence where he's, he just wants to know what, the, what, what are the terms? How much, like, how much do I need to pay? How many people can I bring? And the colonization society, again, the uh, failure is like, they had this great idea. They were going to probably have lovely banquets in DC. They had very little in terms of logistical planning for this kind of thing um, or, or or will to actually do the logistics. And so to me, what that ended up revealing is just like how he was both trying to create a new life, but also was just like, was just constantly becoming vacillating between a sense of optimism and pessimism about life in America as a black person, but also what life in Liberia would be like as a black person. And even once he got there, he was still sending letters back that were just like, about how the organization was failing him and asking for things, uh, which I just, uh, you don't see that level of, of agency for somebody writing in the 1830s and 1840s. Um, you, so you, it, it's not typical of the narrative that we hear. Um, you typically either hear about an abolitionist or you hear about, you know, a, like slave uh, narratives, but you don't get this, this uh, just a black businessman trying to get the best terms within this whole situation that's going on yeah and i felt particularly frustrated and bad for him because i i you know 
having the hindsight of history going, well, he's asking people who don't have the answers. You know, and, and they're just not organized to deal with this level of uh, detail and uh, accountability. But um, I think the other thing, is, I really kind of want to touch on the, um, the Afro-pessimism and the Black optimism that you were you mentioned and kind of how his story kind of illustrates that. Because I think it's such an important thing in the um, this period's history of free Blacks and enslaved Blacks as well. Yeah, so this kind of gets back to, this gets back to the, the well, first of all, to the framework of the book, which is a, a book that is doing historical work and doing archival work, but is is connected with with rhetoric and with language. And so part of you know, reading this, I'm using a kind of contemporary framework of some writing that's been done recently by people um, like Frank Wilderson about uh, Afro-pessimism uh, and people like Fred Moten um, about uh, Black optimism. And so there's this kind of, you know, this uh, much more like deeply philosophical debate about what it means to be Black. And and uh, so I took this kind of very philosophical debate and I was just trying to look to see how at this moment, here is a person living life at this moment that is actually kind of living between these two different kind of subject positions that, that we're still philosophizing and talking about and living in now. Um, and so that the, the, that Afro-pessimism, just the fact that there was just this, this like, this ongoing waiting for an answer, waiting to get in touch with the right person, like you were saying, that they were just, his correspondents were not adequately giving him information. And of course, then it's like, you can't, there's certain times a year that you can travel, certain times you couldn't travel. And just, I mean, he, so just that delay, delay, delay. Um, and so that was where it was just very pessimistic. And he kind of was pessimistic from the jump because he, um, he was somebody that had needs. He he had something like I mean like twenty thousand dollars worth of um, goods in in the contemporary terms and at that moment. So he, he was somebody that was. I mean he knew the governor. He knew the white governor of North Carolina. He he had he was like hey I've got all the trappings that this country says you're supposed to have if you're free and yet I'm still not being treated the same way that like a white person who has less than me is being treated. And so that's that kind of that pessimism, but then there's that that hope of that optimistic hope of of gaining equality and gaining the ability to have, you know, be a fully functioning citizen and 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 have the all the trappings of capitalism. And and it really does just kind of by letter by letter and that's what the book that's what that chapter tracks is just his correspondence. Um, and so you just see him go back and forth between being excited and then just be, like demanding somebody please reply. He's just kind of at his wit's end. Um, and then he finally does go. And once he's there, I mean, like I said, he, he's still not fulfilled in, in what he wants from them. Oh, and I, I think uh, we probably have a little time to talk about the, um, the experience of being in Liberia. And um, kind of this, uh, I kind of want to touch on the this dual, like, we, the, the white supremacy gets rid of free blacks. But then on the other hand, there's this missionary component to them being there as well. And that missionary component and the actual colonization aspect of it affects the natives of what will become Liberia. And maybe you could just kind of briefly talk about how that went for them. <laughs> Yeah, so that's that, and that's the interesting thing too about the, the so the Hillary T chapter touches on this a little bit because he's somebody that is trying to create civilization, and of course you're going to create so like a civilized culture, a, a, um, a civic government, and and learning and education and all these things uh, based on the models that you have from where you know, and so that would be the United States, and so they would try to create a lyceum, so like a, a public lecture series, and you try to do that, um, but all the while there's still people that you know that were living there already and it's amazing too the way that i mean this is just uh, slaps you in the face when you talk about the concept of a uh, of race being a social construct, um, it, I mean, certainly has material consequences. But that once they get there, that um, that the the they re start referring to the natives as blacks, when, and and the, and the natives start kind of when they are in these like violent uprisings, refer to them as the whites. And it's like they are they are no more 
black no more white than they were black when they were here but it's it's that the social system is reproducing itself in terms of oh we need things and the way you get them is by making sure that you employ them or enslave them or you know like threaten them and so there's a lot of those same things that were happening in the united states just repurposing themselves um and 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 by the way that political elite still exists today that those who are descendants of um americo liberians um have were long the political elite in Liberia, and the, it's it's almost like a caste system, um, a certain superiority versus those who are say from like the crew tribe or something like that. So that's it's it's remarkable how that continued. I mean, and there, there's all the other things you'd expect when you're going to go to another country. There's just you know there's massive disease. Um, actually, there was another group, the Maryland in Liberia or Maryland and Africa group, um, one of their main sponsors was a doctor. And so one of his things was trying to get people immunized before they go. And so just, I think in this age of like immunizations and public health, that, that they were much more successful in terms of people surviving the journey and living because they kind of had a, a, a medical side to their, to their project versus just, hey, we just want to get you on the boat and whatever happens, happens. That was kind of if if the ACS had an approach that tended to be it, which was out of sight, out of mind, and that was you know their ultimate downfall. Yeah, and I think that the uh, Teague chapter also does a, a pretty good job of kind of, as you were saying, illustrating how in white supremacy is a system and not just a um, you know and you know when you talk about systemic racism, that's exactly what they uh, exported to Liberia. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and that race at that point, it's, I mean, race are markers of power and they just reproduced a power dynamic with no longer were they on the oppressed side of that. Once some of those colonists that got there, but they seeking to get what they could out of it, out of, out of a bad situation, really. I mean, because it was, it was, they were not given a lot and, and it's all new. I mean, that one of the most remarkable things, it's the arguments made in that very first chapter to kind of get back to the colonization society. They were saying, oh, we'll return them to their homeland, the place of their home. None of the people that went to Liberia were from Liberia or from that area. They were all, we had been, you know, you know, many generations of native born people born in America. America was what they knew. But it was just this whole, again, it's the racism of it. It's like, oh, well, like they're from there. It's like, I mean, I my name is Bjorn. I'm from Norway, but I have never been to Norway. I do not speak Norwegian. Someone could say, return you to your heritage. And I would be very cold and I would not know how to speak the language. And I would not know how to prepare the foods that are there or shelter in the winter or any of those things. Um, and that was what they were facing too. But it was the, that racist stereotype that of oh, the just that whole continent of Africa. If you're from Africa, we could just kind of plop you down and you'll survive. And it was not that way in the least. And like you said, the, the, the institutions and the structures just reproduced once they were there because it wasn't just returning them to their homeland. Well, let's return to the middle ground with Lincoln because I think this is uh, his second address, um, annual address, which I guess would be the State of the Union today, correct? Yeah. So at, the, at that time, they they had switched to annual messages being delivered in writing. I think I think it was Jefferson that made that switch, perhaps, because he just didn't like giving speeches. Uh, and then eventually we go back to people giving them, uh, I think, spoken word, maybe with Wilson. I mean, it's it's really there was a long period where the 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 State of the Union was just given in writing to deliver to Congress. And that's so this is his second annual message, making that final pitch for hey, maybe we can smooth things over, but here's what we could do. And it's, he does a lot of math. He does a lot of social math and really tries to figure it out and talks about how like the, the costs will all work out. Um, you know, Lincoln really, I think is such a fascinating character, but um, I, I'll, I'll go any direction you want with, with Lincoln because he is, you know, on the one hand, both the person that signs the Emancipation Proclamation and, you know, delivers something like the Gettysburg Address and all the rest of it, but also, um, and we'll meet with somebody like Frederick Douglass in his office, but at the same time, he's also, you know, sending people to like look at land in Panama and like funding that and really kind of making this final pitch be between when the Emancipation Proclamation is drafted and when he finally signs the final version, that's where this second annual message happens. He's like, ah, maybe there's a middle ground. Nope. Okay, I'll sign it. Yeah, and I, my understanding of Lincoln has changed a lot because I think um, it's been informed by this kind of tension between wanting to hold the 
nation together at all costs and doing whatever it would take to do that, but at the same time, knowing that he can't. And there's this, and I think that his two arguments in the annual um, address kind of a, kind of point to exactly that. Like, let's pay the slaveholders to come back, and you know, we'll free the slaves, but you get money, and, and then we'll send them away. So it's this, it's poorly argued, and it kind of just goes exactly back to that first chapter, correct? Right? Yeah. I mean, it just goes to show that it wasn't, I mean, in some ways it wasn't about money. He's like, look, well, federal government will pay you. And, and the, the plan was really going to go into, it, it's amazing. It was, it was scheduled to be like payments were scheduled to be given up until like 1900. So he's writing this in uh, what, 1865 or, I mean, so he's, he's giving this message and he's, and he's trying to make the, or, made of 1863 and so he's trying to make this final this final pitch uh and like has the money for it and says we'll do it but i mean that that's i mean it, again it's it's tradition and it's fear and it's all the rest of those things and nobody from the south was biting um so it, it, it it's truly an example of where like the kind of the the reason and rationality of the enlightenment like if it's just pure reason then like maybe somebody sees that but it's not it's human beings involved first of all and shouldn't pay anybody for another human being and it was never really just about money um and whether or not they would be properly compensated it was all of the other power dynamics and feelings involved as well. Well, and I, I think that uh, Lincoln's relationship to colonization is interesting. So maybe if you could talk a little bit, because he's he had kind of supported it prior to this as well, correct? Yeah, so again, because he was somebody that that I that idealized Clay. I mean, himself being a, a native Kentuckian, uh, that he he saw Clay as just this ideal character. Again, that that kind of moderation, the the great compromiser, the one that could bring people together. And so early on in his in his younger days, he's giving you know Lyceum speeches in support of colonization. Uh, so he's very much in support of that in his early political days, and is still in support of it when he gains the presidency. And, and even though there are these moments, you know, like his Cooper Union address where he can see him, he's making the kind of the case that the the constitution is anti is an anti-slavery document, uh, he's still kind of got this, the, it, it's really kind of a middle states slash Western perspective. The, really the colonization movement was really populated by people from Maryland, Upper Virginia, maybe a few people from like Pennsylvania or New York, and it could kind of go out into Tennessee and Kentucky a little bit, but it really wasn't anybody from like Georgia. It wasn't folks from Maine, you know, like the further north or the further south you got. So it was, it, it's kind of fitting that in the geography of America that really the colonization movement and somebody like Lincoln, it was this, this kind of middle states or like this kind of more Western frontiers person kind of argument for just trying to find a middle ground because they didn't really have i mean in his position being out on the western frontier like you you weren't as, there was less vested on either side so you could kind of think at least this is me kind of psychologizing you you, you were less vested because there weren't large uh slave plantations out in the west you know when he's growing up and seeing this stuff it's more like you're just think kind of thinking through the arguments as you're giving a, a speech you know to a group of folks well, yeah, and I think that's a, that's a good place to leave Lincoln. If you were to summarize the entire um, argument that you have and and kind of what we should take away from the colonization moment of history, um, what would your elevator speech uh, pitch be? This is good. This is also bringing in my, my presentation instructor mode. I would say that the colonization movement like any failed movement in history should be analyzed. You shouldn't, you shouldn't start and end with the outcome. The process needs to be understood because it's a deeply human process. And there's a really good chance that that will recur on a different issue. And so this was a deeply human debate in which there were all kinds of flaws. And while one, you know, one side wins out and one side loses, at the moment it seemed viable. At the moment it was out being kicked around. And so what what gave rise to that? So it's it's look at the process. That look at if something fails, why? Uh, and also that there's still a lot that was un, that we can understand about our history and our humanity 
by just looking at that process. So that's the elevator pitch is uh, just because it failed doesn't mean that it was a failure in terms of that moment. And to dig in deeper, we'll teach us something about ourselves.